Hello everybody, welcome back. So in problem 10 to B, well, it looks really, really similar to 10 to A, and that's intentional. I thought I would, I would rewrite the problem a little bit just to show how the type of data that we're given can influence the type of test that we're going to be doing. So let, we'll go through the problem. You'll see all the similarities and, and maybe you'll spot some of the differences. Uh, again, I should make a little edit here. This says again, sigma is unknown, but assumed to be equal. So we'll keep that same assumption that we're carrying over from 10 to A, okay? So same, same problem. A friend told me that golden retrievers are a faster breed of dog than a border collie. We are interested in determining whether the data would support this claim. So we get same sample, 29 golden retrievers, 30 border collies. Again, I like to highlight these bits of information. We're running them in a 100 meter dog race. After the race, you gather all their times and calculate their speeds. You find the average speed for the golden retriever is 50 kilometers an hour. For the border collie, 44.4 kilometers an hour. We have standard deviations here and here, and we're going to test that claim, our friend's claim at Alpha 05. So if you go back, if you have the workbook printed off, go back and look at problem 10 to A, and you'll see that it is extremely similar. The difference being problem 10 to A gave us the time that it took for the dog to complete the 100 meter race. Now we have the average speed. And so that's gonna change how we formulate our test. Because now, in order to, to, to test our friend's claim that the golden retriever, and I'll formulate my terms in exactly the same way, so I'm just writing them down in the same order that they appear, right? I have golden retriever first and then border collie second, so that's how I'm defining them. Now I wanna test my friend's claim, same claim that they're faster, which means given that our data is measured in speed, kilometers an hour or miles per hour, now this becomes an upper tail test because a higher speed is indicative, of course, of a faster dog. So now we're taking the same problem that we did in the previous problem, but now the data is a little bit different. And so we can see how that data influences the type of test that we're going to do. The rest of this, extremely, extremely similar. We're doing a t-test. Oh, I should justify my formulation first. If the evidence supports the null hypotheses, well, now we're saying that the golden retriever goes no faster than the border collie. At most, they go as quickly as fast as the border collie. The alternative hypotheses, well, that's saying now that the golden retriever does go faster, that on average, their speed is greater than, in other words, they're going faster than the border collie. Okay, our test statistic, so once again, we're under this assumption that the standard deviations or the variances are assumed to be true. So what I need here is this pooled estimator. Here I'm just writing it a little bit differently than in the previous problem. Here I'm just factoring it out because we know that's, that pooled variance belongs in the numerator of each of those. So I've just factored it out. It's entirely the same calculation. So before I can calculate that test statistic, I need that pooled estimator, which looks something like this. And then this gives us certainly an easier calculation for degrees of freedom. So if I put in our numbers, I have 29 minus one times that first standard deviation, 1271 squared, plus the next one was 31, 
minus 1 times that standard deviation squared divided by 29, 31, minus 2, 1. So let's see what that gives us. 28 times 1271 squared plus 30 times 862 squared divided by 2931 minus 2. I have my pooled estimate of the variance is 116.42. Now we can get our test statistic. So our sample means here, I had the border, uh, the golden retriever was 50 minus 44.4. That hypothesized difference again was zero. We did some examples in the first part of module 10 where we had something different for that hypothesized value. If you need to review that, you go back and look at those z-tests. It doesn't change much here. It's all the same complications as it added in those previous problems. And here now I have my pooled estimate, 1642 over 129 and 31. So my test statistic here is going to be 50 minus 44.4 divided by the square root 116 over 29 and that gives me my test statistic of 2.0 or 2.09. I'm rounding it just ever so slightly. Okay, well, the rest is same as always. I have got my test statistic. I've got my degrees of freedom here is 58. I can scroll down to my T tables and I'm looking for 60 degrees of freedom. And here we go. I'm choosing 60 again because we don't have 58, right? We don't have all that detail in these t-tables. 60 is the closest. So I ignore everything else. Just that one row of critical values and those corresponding probabilities. My test statistic was 2.09. 2.09 is between these two. Very close to this one, but not quite. It's just between those two values, and so I come up here, and that gives me my relevant probabilities for my test. So this is a one-tail test, so I don't need to multiply anything by two. So here I have that my p-value is less than 0 0.025, greater than 0 0.025. And that's part C. We've got our p-value. We're doing this test at alpha 0.05. We certainly have sufficient evidence to reject, again, because if the p-value is less than 0 0.025, it has to be less than 0 0.05. So our exposure here to a type 1 error is less than what we're comfortable with. Again, don't forget what those level of significance means, what the p-value means. Alpha is 0.05. I'm willing to accept a 5% chance of a type 1 error. Here, my exposure to a type 1 error is even less. So I'll take that risk, right? I might still be committing a type 1, but the chances are sufficiently small. So I'll take that risk. I will choose to reject the null hypotheses. Now, before we get into that interpretation, what is our critical value? Come back down here. Alpha was 0 0.05. And we're coming down to, again, we're using 60 degrees of freedom instead of 58, just because that's our closest value. And so that was 167. So that critical value for 05, that's technically 60 degrees of freedom is 
This is an upper tail test, so I'm going to leave it as a positive. The previous problem, remember when we were working with time, it was a lower tail test, so our critical value was in the lower tail. And both of these, again, we can draw a picture because even statistics is easier. If I could draw a picture of it, nope, that's not right. This was an upper tail test. I'm going to reject if that test statistic is greater than 167 because this is an area of 0.05. Here I have my test statistic was 2.09. Certainly that's in my rejection space and certainly that p-value is less than alpha. So we get consistent results which is really what we had better get. Both of these uh, approaches lead us to reject which means, finally, we do have evidence to support our friend's claim. Our evidence supports the alternative hypotheses. We have sufficient evidence here to show that, on average, the speed of a golden retriever is greater than the speed of a border collie. Good. That's it. Notice the similarities again with the previous problem. Much of this exercise was the same. But because our data was measured in speed instead of time, well, that's what made this an upper tail test. Okay, guys. Thank you for watching. Hope that was helpful. Bye-bye.